Okay, it's uh, off. Uh, Welcome to Frankenstein. So, has it started already? Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, oh. um, I think so. Because I wanted to ask if there are any questions first. Anyone have any issues that need to discuss? I think my summary was a, a bit much this time. I didn't know. For, for our next volume, how do you want us to summarize it? Because it's a quite a few chapters. Well, you should talk about the monster. In this particular yes. case, the monster is the, like, what's the monster? He's the man in the state of nature. But, I mean, I wrote like eight pages. So. Oh, I can't wait to read it. Uh, <laughs> sounds awesome. Um, uh, I got into it. That's good. <laughs> she wrote her fourth paper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah too bad it's not on Frankenstein. Um, all right, uh, so last time we talked about Victor. And um, our goal last time was to figure out what motivated Victor and what that meant for the novel. Um, and let me just summarize what I think were the main points of that last discussion. Uh, first of all, Victor has complex motivations. He is aggressive and possessive and his mind refuses to acknowledge either of these things, his aggression or his possessiveness, as a basis for his activity. He is not concerned with knowledge. He is concerned with control. He is not concerned with knowledge. He seeks a kind of glory as a creator. We also saw last time that Victor was a creator, but he rejects his creature. Unlike the God of Genesis who looked back on his creation and said, it is good, Victor looked on his creation and said, it is disgusting and repulsive. We looked at a particular passage on page 56 in my book where Victor is filled with breathless horror and disgust filled his heart at the sight of his creature. The third thing we recognized about Victor is that he rejects responsibility for his creation. After having created him, after having recognized how disgusting the creature is that he created, he abandons him to the wilds and then collapses himself in shame and bonkerhood, craziness. All of this, I think, is summed up by saying that Victor is aggressive, and his aggression is cast inward as a desire for knowledge, and outward at the same time as a desire to be the creator of a new race. We will see throughout the rest of the book that Victor's impulses are the same as the monster's impulses. Victor creates a doppelganger, a second self. But page 74, chapter 7, for those without my edition, which is everyone, I think, basically. Um, in a paragraph that begins with the word, no one can conceive the anguish. Looks to be about halfway through the chapter. A little more than halfway. In chapter 7, you say? Chapter 7 of book 1. Bottom of page 50. Bottom of page 50, thank you. Victor writes, no one can conceive the anguish I suffered during the remainder of the night which I spent cold and wet in the open air, very typical of Victor. He creates this monster, unleashes it on the world, but man, the anguish that I felt at this. His creation is all about him. But I did not feel the inconvenience of the weather. My imagination was busy in scenes of evil and despair. Don't you pity him? I considered the being whom I had cast among mankind and endowed with the will and power 
to effect purposes of horror, such as the deed which he had done nearly in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit let loose from the grave and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. So later on we're going to see you know, the, the, the same reaction when the monster kills Henry. It's the pity that he feels is almost as bad, in fact it is as bad, or it's actually worse than the injustice and death that other feels, others feel, excuse me. He will say after Justina is, uh, is executed for the murder of Henry, uh, no, for, for the murder of William, that it would be better to be dead than to feel the guilt and shame that I feel at this particular moment. His, I don't know exactly what the word for that is, self-absorption, the um, sanctimoniousness of his particular brand of self-pity is something to marvel at, I think, over the course of the book. But what also comes across, I think, in the account of Henry is that his scientific endeavors are really a way to avoid taking on adult responsibility. Instead of marrying Elizabeth, his more than sister, and making children the old-fashioned way, he is going to make children in the new-fashioned way. He's going to make them out of pieces of corpse. <laughs> he avoids, really, throughout the book, normal human relationships, he avoids moral education, he avoids adult responsibility. It seems he is constantly seeking to be alone. His dreams are always extraordinarily abstract from ordinary human beings. He's not so much concerned about the health of Elizabeth, or later on we will see Henry. He's not concerned about their health. He's concerned about the future of the human race. And it is for the greater good of the future of the human race that I'm going to have to allow a couple of these eggs to be broken. But man, the omelet later on will be delish. This is just another way of avoiding responsibility. Being concerned in the abstract about benevolence or humanity, but never about particular human beings. Just a couple of passages about this right at the end. This is in book three, so you haven't read it yet, but that's all right. Um, as he fixes himself to start making the monster for the monster, the girl monster, I should say. It was indeed a filthy process in which I was engaged. It's on page 158 and 9 in mine. During my first experiment, a kind of enthusiastic frenzy had blinded me to the horror of my employment. My mind was intently fixed on the consummation of my labor and my eyes shut to the horror of my proceedings. So he's always thinking about this abstract good. I'm just going to read one more line from 177. This is at the end of chapter 4 in my, in book 3. Um, well, I'm not going to read it, so we'll, we'll be getting to that next time. So, Victor, in other words, is a scientist. And as a scientist, he seems to be the most sanctimonious lover of humanity you have ever encountered never liking any individual human being, or ultimately caring about their fate enough to act. It suits him to sacrifice individual human beings for the sake of some vague benefit, or later on, some vague threat to mankind. And these are the points, at least, that we attempted to make last time about Victor. Now we need to turn to the monster. 
that he created and that is the topic, I think, of volume two. The volume two is where we can fall in love with the monster. We can kind of enter into his own situation. Um, we can try to consider him on his own terms, from his own point of view. He tells his own story. Think about what's going on in, in, the, in the course of the book. The monster is telling a story to Victor, who is telling a story to Walton. Volume two, the middle of the book, is three times removed from reality. Right? The monster is telling Victor, who's telling Walton, who's writing a letter to his sister. This is not admissible in a court of law. It's three removes from hearsay. It dreams someday of having the, the, uh, the value of hearsay. It is so far removed from reality. And we should just say a couple things, as uh, Ms. Kendrick pointed out in a way, uh, in writing an eight-page summary, which once again, I'm just really looking forward to reading. I'm thinking I might die before I have to read it. Um, uh, uh, At least you know I was thorough. That's good. What's the relationship between Shelley herself and Rousseau? I actually tried to do some investigation on this. There is good evidence that while she was writing Frankenstein, she was reading the Reveries of the Solitary Walker, Rousseau's book, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I think I'll prove this later on um, as we go through and talk about the monster. There is no evidence, not in her notebooks, not anywhere else, that she ever read the Second Discourse, though there is good evidence, once again, that her husband did. And, uh, you know, I know what I talk about in bed with my wife is usually something like the Second Discourse. Um, so there was pillow talk, because <laughs> that's that. Um, on the particular topic. So we know that she read uh, several of Rousseau's, we'll call them artistic or individualistic works, reveries uh, being the chief among them, and was doing it at this time, wrote in her notebook um, on, on the reveries. Now, um, I would submit that volume two of Shelley's Frankenstein is a very straightforward, almost word-for-word -word account of Rousseau's second discourse. At least the part of it where we see the education of the monster. So I'm going to try to prove this as we go through. Uh, and, and, and the importance of this, I mean, it's not really a, uh, we shouldn't see this as an academic exercise. The importance of this is that Rousseau's diagnosis of what is wrong with civilized man ends up being, in an extreme form, the diagnosis that Shelley wants us to conclude about what is wrong with the monster. So if you remember back to, so this is what's at stake or why it's important to, uh, to undertake what we're going to. If we remember back to last class on Rousseau, the problem with civilized man is that he's divided against himself. That he's, he, when he thinks about himself, he sees only other people. And when he sees other people, he only thinks about how they can be of use to himself. They are not whole like the natural man was. And they are not whole like a citizen in a civilized society could be if that society was properly organized. They're divided. And this ends up being the problem that the monster has with himself. The monster is miserable. Civilized man is miserable, and they are miserable for the same reasons. They are divided. They imbibe the view that others have of them. And it's actually really rather sad to see this happen in the monster. Is this the same idea of um, the, uh, like the veil, Du Bois? the veil, of, like the false consciousness, where you see yourself, or the double consciousness, I'm sorry. Is that the same concept? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, um, Du Bois, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, American thinker, early 20th century, um, uh, it's not, it, 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 I would say it's very generally the same thing, but what he, he, I would say, has a different understanding of what you're divided against. Um, 
But, and, and, and you can see that in the phrase that you use there, a false consciousness that you get from, uh, that you abide from others. Uh, because what Du Bois is talking about more is what we would, in, we would call ideology. Our inability to access reality because of the ideas of, you know, derived from the mode of production that uh, end up giving us our ideas. That's all just a fancy way of saying uh, Du Bois was influenced by Marx. And only insofar as Marx and Rousseau share a same criticism, uh, kind of in categories or form, would I say that they're the same. OK, um, so let's first of all prove the monster is natural man. All right, so you guys read it. What do you observe on this? What things does the monster share with natural man? We can even uh, quote chapter and verse in the books. So that would be fine. What does the monster share with natural man? Just, you know, Ms. Kendrick, thank you. You are an expert on this. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't call myself an expert. It's um, good enough for government work. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that the, the monster understands right away is hunger and thirst. He, he leaves the house and he doesn't understand light. He doesn't understand the sun. He, he grows to learn these things, but at first the only things that he can fix, the only things that he knows are that he's hungry and that he's thirsty and that the stream will provide him to cure his thirst. Okay, good. So his, his initial natural needs are the same as the natural needs of, uh, of, of the savage man that Rousseau describes. That's good. That's right at the beginning of chapter 3. What else can we say? When he's in the hut and watching the family engage the blind man, the kids, he one of the like, feel the sores and the emotions, but he can. They were having the love between the two kids and the blind man. They play the music, and so he definitely is moved by that. Yep. Um, but I think that yeah. actually is going to be later on in the education. I mean, I, we have to return to that. I think that's later on in the educational process, uh, because uh, so let's let's bring that back up in, in a few minutes here. Other things he shares, Ms. Stickerman. Um, he learns like fire, so he understands how to make some sort of like tool to cook the food, and he learns how to add wood so it continues to burn, and it keeps him warm at night. That's good. In fact, that's right out of uh, the second discourse. That's good. Go ahead. Uh, initially, he's like whole in himself. He doesn't seek other human. Other people. He seems to be satisfied by himself. It's, it's an accident that he comes to the hovel. Does he have language? Uh, no language. He can't really even sense things properly. It's actually very interesting. This is right at the beginning of chapter 3 in the second volume. First paragraph, the second sentence. Um, but we can start at the beginning of chapter 3. It is with considerable difficulty that I remember the original era of my being even no recollection of it. All the events of that period appear confused and indistinct. The strange multiplicity of sensation seized me, and I saw, felt, heard, and smelt at the same time. And it was indeed a long time before I learned to distinguish between the operations of my various senses. So he just, like, soaks up the world around him without even being able to figure out how he's different from the world around him. So in Rousseau's context, that would be the savage man, the natural man? Yes, so still very much without language, state. without being able to differentiate himself from the stream of nature, to figure out where I end and this plant begins or this animal begins. I mean, that's how... Uh, as you as you look at a little baby or something like that, and you often wonder, you know, what do, are, is that baby looking at me? Uh, the the eyes will be open, uh, but all the senses are bombarding the baby at the same time. That seems to be kind of what's going on here. He, hearing, seeing, touching, all of it jumbles together, and you can't even figure out what you're seeing and hearing and feeling. 
um, it's so indistinct uh, at that point. Um, let's ju just turn the page for a second. A couple other places, um, uh, and I think this very much at the at the end of this third paragraph here in in the same chapter. No distinct ideas occupied my mind. All was confused. I felt light and hunger and thirst and darkness. And innumerable sounds rang in my ears and on all signs various scents saluted me. The only object that I could distinguish was the bright moon and I fixed my eyes on that with pleasure. Next, you know, skip a paragraph and go to the one with the moon. My eyes became accustomed to the light and perceived objects in the right forms. I distinguished the insect from the herb and by degrees one herb from another. So there is this sense that you're, you can sympathize, you can enter into the plight of, of the monster here because you're, you're seeing him arrive at human consciousness. You're seeing him arrive at the ability to differentiate himself from that which comes around him. That's what I mean by the arrival at human consciousness. The beginning, I mean, so, so there's almost this account of how we come to have speech, right? The beginning of having speech, according to Rousseau, is being able to distinguish yourself from what comes around you. And then, to be able to distinguish the things that come around you from one another. The first, you have to be able to see that you're different from the nature around you. Second, that the things that are in nature are different from each other. And only then is there a possibility of human beings being able to develop language. Consciousness comes before language. And this is precisely, I would submit, what you get here with the monster. Initially, he cannot distinguish himself from the whole. Eventually, he becomes to distinguish the various parts of the whole and himself from the whole. And then, he has the, I don't know, is it a fortuitous thing? That is, he stumbles across the people who live in the hovel. I don't know if it's fortuitous or not. We're going to have to look at this. So this, you know, once again, I think is right out of part one of the second discourse. His achievement of language is precisely the account of the achievement of language that you get in Rousseau. Now, um, Mr. Nadarovich points out the big difference, I think, between the monster and Rousseau's natural man. Okay? In Rousseau, the natural man develops alongside other natural men, if you want to think of it like that. But in Frankenstein, the natural man coexists with civilized people. That is, he acquires language faster than the natural man ever would, but why does he acquire language faster than the natural man ever would? Because there are already people around who have language. And from those people, he can eventually learn and absorb it. It takes a long time to create language. It takes a lot less time to learn one that already exists. Which means that the natural man's civilizing is expedited. But it also means that the natural man's civilizing is a reflection of what those who, who are using language around him think. He adopts their categories. He adopts their point of view. He adopts their way of viewing the world. He adopts their lessons. He is educated by them. His focus is narrowed by them. 
His understanding of what is good and bad, ugly and beautiful, ends up being traceable to them because he gets his language from them. The way that the monster puts it when the monster is telling his own story, and this is one of those, uh, one of those very moving moments, I think, in the book, is that his sorrow increased with his knowledge. Volume 2, Chapter 5. Frankenstein had said that earlier, actually, when he was building the monster, that his sorrow grew with his knowledge about how to build the monster. Um, but let's leave that aside for now, OK? He becomes sorrowful as he gains knowledge. Why is that? Why does the monster gain sorrow as he gains wisdom? as he gains the language around him. This Kendrick. He becomes aware of what he's been missing. He sees the love and affection and realizes that he's different from that. He never had a mother or a father to love him. And that, that makes him sorrowful. He has no one to confide in. No one to share company with. So if he, he's alone and alienated from this particular family. All right, that's good. That's, that's got to be part of the answer, Mr. Espinosa. Um, seeing the family and uh, listening to their interaction, he becomes conscious of himself. I think that's when he becomes conscious of uh, the fact that he is part human or whatever, and um, he starts to feel um, he starts to feel emotion because of what he's seeing, um, um, like what he's. Uh, Well, certainly, book, volume one is about that. I think the th really the theme of volume one is Victor, and the theme of volume two is the monster. And the monster definitely is a creation of science. But this, the story of how the monster becomes, I don't know, a distinctive creature is what tracks Rousseau. That would be my. Um, Tension on that. There's nothing scientific about the monster's education, for instance. His education is uh, uh, is ordered, and uh, the order that the education takes place is the one that Rousseau describes. Uh, I would submit in Second Discourse. Natural man distinguishing himself from nature. Um, it's just an expedited process because of the existence of civilized people around him. So we need to talk about his misery yet. Um, so I think we have some good uh, answers here. Imagine this scenario. Um, the monster sits there in the hovel for a long time. I'll get you in a second. Um, the monster sits there in the hovel, in the, in the shelter for a long time. He goes up to the blind guy, the dad, and says, they, they hit it off. They, they form a deep bond and friendship. And the people, uh, and, the, and the son, and, uh, and future daughter-in-law, and the daughter, they come into the hovel, and they see their father so happy with his new friend that they welcome the monster into the family, and they become one. And in fact, the daughter falls in love 
with the monster, and there's a double wedding between the son and the Arab chick and the daughter and the monster, and everyone's happy, and maybe the novel could end like that. C couldn't the monster still be happy? He observes, he, you know, plans his way of integrating himself into the civilized community that's there in the hut. Couldn't it happen? Could it happen? What are the obstacles to it happening, if it couldn't? His face. Go ahead. Like the knowledge of the nature of the human race just causes him sadness, just like the vice and the script, the script the script. I know, and he, and they, but these, these folks seem different. I mean, these folks seem different. Maybe they could accept, I mean, they've been rejected themselves by society and forced to leave. And if there's anyone who can re accept a reject, it's a reject. There's a mathematical equation in there. <laughs> uh, right? I mean, this, is, this would make sense. Why can't this happen, Mr. Hash? Because uh, now he's, he's in that family state, like Rousseau was talking about. The man starts congregating his family. Now he can start comparing himself and the things around him to other people. And that's the... That's the the state of his misery, because now he can have vice, and now he can have virtue, and um, and all the licentiousness that comes along with that. So the more he learns, the more he learns how to compare and how different he is, and that's going to be the source of his misery. Yes, what does he learn? That's excellent. What does he learn? That he is gruesome. That they they reject him, and they they can do nothing but reject him. And then he internalizes their evaluation of him. This is ultimately the source of his alienation and unhappiness and rebellion himself. He looks at his reflection in the pool, right? What does he see? A hideous, disgusting monster. But only in comparison to the other people he's now aware of, right? He becomes aware of his monstrous character because he compares, he takes their evaluation of him and makes it his own. So yes, in comparison, but that's not really, uh, that's not really the axis I'm going after, I think, Mr. Bauer. The axis I'm going after is that he gets his standard of evaluation from outside of him, from the others, from society. Ms. Dickman? He encounters, though, that reaction before. Is it different because he doesn't have language and he's not quite aware of the comparison going on? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it's just, it's different. I mean, it's really planned. Um, his introduction to that family is planned, um, and it's after he achieves language, it's after he recognizes the problems uh, that he will be facing. The prejudices that they will have have already kind of become part of him by the time he does introduce himself to them. So just, just go back to that, to that, um, the history of the monster. The monster is happy when he is whole, when he doesn't recognize that he is part or could be part of a civil society. He is happy when he is unconscious, undifferentiated from others and undifferentiated from nature. This is the equivalent of having his hand in blubber. He's happy when he's unconscious, or pre-conscious, is what I mean by that. To know is to be sad. To differentiate yourself from nature and to recognize how others will view you is to be sad. To have sympathy 
To have intelligence means to sink into misery and eventually to rebel against your creator, even though I think we've established that his creator isn't exactly God the Father Almighty. And it seems, and this is uh, what I'm going to try to establish now, that there is no way in this book to establish the human urge for unity or wholeness or happiness in civilized life. There is no way to return to that original wholeness or unity on the level of civil society. Once you live with others, you are miserable. The monster illuminates this. Victor illuminates this. First, let's consider the monster. This is on oh, I have the wrong book. This is on page 117, volume 2, chapter 5. These wonderful narrations Thank you. These wonderful narrations.